Okay. All right, so we'll begin whenever you're ready. Um, so before we go into chronology, I'm just going to ask you a couple little things. Can you bring up a little bit of the American, among the American diplomatic community, what was the popular perception of SWAPO and some of the other liberation movements in Southern Africa, say the ANC and um, MPLA, although by that point they already had control to an extent. What was the popular perception of them? Well, I'm not sure what you mean by popular, but I would just say that um, in the foreign policy community in which I live and worked at the time, um, the perception was that Southern Africa faced two choices, it had two possible roads for development. One road was violent transitions, um, armed struggle if you like, and the other road would be uh, negotiated transitions, political solutions. Um, and it was very much in the American interest and in the Western interest, and we worked very closely at this time with um, our key allies uh, to have um, as much possible support for political solutions, for negotiated transitions. That was the case in Zimbabwe. Um, it was the case further north. It was what we knew would eventually take place in South Africa itself. Um, it's what completely failed to take place in Angola and Mozambique, where you had a, a, a pathetic collapse by the colonial power and then a mass sort of exodus and a vacuum created that was filled by Soviet Cuban adventurism with their proxies. You mentioned the MPLA, which was in effect installed in office by, with the help of, um, <coughs> of the Cubans and the, and the Soviets and a few others. Um, so our interests were best served if we could have, if we could avoid that kind of messy, militarized transition. I mean, we, we saw there, was, there were two roads and, and basically um, our interests, and we believe the interests of the people who lived in Southern Africa and live there now, are best served by, by uh, negotiation, by power sharing, by working together, that sort of thing. Uh, so <coughs> when the Reagan administration entered office in 1981, we inherited from the Carter administration a negotiating framework uh, around UN Security Council Resolution 435, which I believe you're familiar with. Um, we inherited it, but it wasn't going anywhere. So we faced a choice. Do we continue to beat our heads against the wall? Do we walk away altogether and let the Europeans handle it? Or do we maybe make some modifications to it or some additions to it? And that's what we did, the latter. We made some additions to the inherited framework by bringing into the uh, negotiating framework the issue of Angola and the Cuban presence in Angola. Um, but the, the, the perception of SWAPO at the time, or the ANC, to get back to your original question, we saw them as political movements that had a military wing. They were heavily dependent on their supporters in the East Bloc and the Soviet Bloc. Um, and as a result, it showed sometimes. I mean, that's, that's the reality of the world. Um, but we never made the mistake, and I want to underscore that, of, of saying that s because SWAPO had a Soviet relationship or a Cuban relationship or an MPLA relationship that we wouldn't talk to it or that we didn't want to see it participate. Um, but we also had to deal with the South African government of the time, which was the, uh, the government, the white minority government of the National Party which was not about to hand over power to SWAPO on a silver platter. So, in fact, they didn't want to leave Namibia at all. So our job was to persuade them that there could be a framework for leaving and decolonizing Namibia. It was Africa's last colony. <laughs> and there, there was a, a possible framework for doing that. 
um, and that yes, SWAPA would participate in the elections, and yes, they might even win. But in the right context, that could serve the interests of everybody, including the South Africans. So it took us eight years to get there. <laughs> it was a long story, but let, let, me, let me stop there. And, oh, you mentioned the ANC as well. If you want to come back to that, we can. Um, the ANC, which was born in 1912, was far and away the oldest uh, political movement representing the interests of the disenfranchised in South Africa. Africans, mixed race South Africans, South Africans from South Asia, uh, and, and some whites too, actually. <laughs> so it was a multi, always was a multiracial party, the ANC. Um, and, and we understood that they, they had um, a certain brand. They had called for all kinds of very dramatic change. Um, but, you know, that's what liberation groups sometimes do. Um, we maintained a dialogue with the ANC in exile, and we maintained a relationship and discussion with the internal wing, if you like, which in fact was the UDF during the mid and late 1980s. Um, there were those in the United States, I'm getting back to your original question, who thought that we should have no dealings with SWAPO, no dealings with the ANC. But hey, I'm a State Department guy. I believe in uh, political solutions. And if you want political solutions, you have to be willing to talk to people. <laughs> Let me stop there. <laughs> I want to return briefly to 435. Resolution 435. Yeah. Because in your book you mentioned there was a lot of skepticism about whether or not this framework, which was developed in the 70s, um, whether or not that it could be successfully implemented at all regarding, um, say, the whites accepting it as well as SWAPO accepting mm -hmm. it. Can you go into a little bit into the doubts that existed? Well, the primary issue was persuading Pretoria, persuading the South African government to implement Resolution 435. They had no interest at all in doing that because that was, first of all, there were Afrikaners and others in the white community living in Namibia, and those were the folks with the votes. And they actually, you know, sent people to the local assembly and, and, and so forth. So for the National Party to sort of talk openly about decolonizing and leaving, sort of suicidal, I mean, they didn't want to do that. I mean, let's face it, Namibia was um, seen in South African white circles at the time as part of South Africa. That's the way they viewed it. The real estate was about the size of Texas. And SWAPO had not liberated a, a square centimeter of it. And so why should they give it up? That was the view that we ran into. So, you know, Resolution 435 was a piece of paper from their perspective. And, and uh, if they didn't agree to it, it wasn't going to go forward. Simple as that. So we had a job of uh, persuading them. I think SWAPO probably at the time, I'm talking 1979, 1980, 81, the leadership of SWAPO probably saw 435, Resolution 435 as their best chance because it offered the prospect of a internationally supervised transition with South African controlled police and military confined to base, with refugees returning, with the establishment of um, possibilities for refugees uh, to uh, be registered for the, for the election, with election rolls prepared and election conducted and all the rest. SWAPO was confident that it would do well in the elections if there ever were elections under international supervision. So the, they were not opposed to 435. They had some questions about any efforts to change it or to amend it. And we had to amend it in certain ways, but they were, we, we were able to be persuasive on that eventually. Yeah. Now, before we go into the linkage policy with yeah. Cuba, 
how much influence then the, the, the Western contact you've had? Because you had five Western countries who were perceived to be some of South Africa's strongest allies. You know, it was, it was France, West Germany, Britain, Canada, USA. How much influence did they have with South Africa realizing, okay, now we have these people trying to negotiate an end to apartheid and, mm. and the conflict, but they're some of our strongest allies. They were the Western powers on the Security Council in 1978. That's who the Western Five were. And uh, because uh, UN Security Council Resolution 435 was introduced in 1978, it got the unanimous endorsement of the Western Five in the Security Council. And from then on, they became known as the Western Five or um, the Contact Group, the Western Contact Group. Um, yes, uh, we were all allies. We didn't all see the situation exactly the same way, but we recognized that there was strength in numbers and that we needed to hang together and work together or we'd hang separately on this one. So, um, and I, just to take us back to that time period, if you look at the resolutions that were passed and the debates that took place in both the General Assembly and the Security Council in the 1970s, I don't have exact numbers, but I would I would imagine that the, the numbers would be like 80 to 85, 90 percent of those resolutions dealt with a handful of issues that were hot button issues for the non-aligned movement. And the non-aligned movement with its um, occasional supporters from the Soviet bloc, they involved the Middle East peace process and they involved the Southern African decolonization process. So the Western Five had a job on their hands. Our job was to work with the Africans of Sub-Saharan Africa, the frontline states particularly, as well as South Africa. So the contact group's job was to be a mediator between the African frontline states and the South African government. The frontline states being Tanzania, which was chairman when I first came into the State Department uh, of the group. You had Zambia, you had Mozambique, you had Zimbabwe, Botswana, and Angola. Uh, those were the African frontline states. So there was a coalition of African states and there was South Africa, and then you had the political parties such as SWAPO. It was um, a complex piece of machinery to negotiate in. Um, but, you know, frankly, the, um, we, we derived, I guess you could say, broadened leverage, broadened support by being part of the contact group. But we didn't just assume that they would agree with us. We had to work with them, negotiate with them, and get agreement with them as to what we would say in each meeting. Should I be looking at the camera or at you? You should be, you should be looking towards, towards us, otherwise it's like gazing into the eyes of the viewer and you know, that Mona Lisa effect. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I should be looking at you. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I right. mean, it's... It's 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 Back fine because no clips are really going to be longer yeah, than okay. 30, 15 40, minutes or 20 seconds. Minutes. Yeah. 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 So, All right. but now I want to bump in then to the Cuban issue mm -hmm. because that was seen as one of the of among the Western Bloc as a, a, a good way to get leverage over the South African government with regards to coming to a diplomatic solution. Can you talk a little bit about that? The Cuban presence in Angola was as a conventional military presence. The only capable fighting force in Central and Southern Africa apart from the South African Defense Forces. And it was serving a variety of purposes. It was bolstering and maintaining the MPLA government in power. It was also capable of supporting SWAPO and defending SWAPO bases. And if Namibia had been decolonized while the Cubans were still there, the Cubans could have, it would have been a cakewalk. They could have walked right down to the Western Cape. There would have been nothing to stop them if they had decided to do that. Or if the new Namibian government invited them in. Mm 
and from the South African perspective of the government at that time, that was the last thing they wanted to see was Soviet supported, Soviet armed Cuban troops on their border. So, so holding on to Namibia was a way of keeping that presence at some distance from South Africa's own borders. Um, and therefore, the idea of <coughs> linkage, which, which the uh, Reagan administration introduced into the negotiation, was that yes, South Africans ought to leave Namibia. Yes, South Africans ought to stop coming across the border into Angola. <laughs> but in that context, which involved the implementation of Resolution 435, it would be a good idea if the Cubans also left Angola and that Angolans could deal with each other. As you know, <laughs> the Angolan Civil War was stopped in its tracks in 1975, but there still were two other fighting groups that did not accept the monopoly of power of the MPLA as the governing party. And it was clear that if the Cubans left, there would be a need for some kind of a peace process inside Angola. And that, that was also uh, something which, in general, we, we supported. I want to be clear, however, that we did not link Angolan peace to Namibian peace. What we linked was Cuban troop withdrawal to Namibian peace. And that's the, an important distinction for us to have uh, stated very, very clearly. If we tried to add to the mix sorting out the future of Angolan politics, or for that matter, sorting out the future of South African politics as all part of the same negotiation, it would have blown up. There's, there's, in any negotiation we, we found, you have to define what you're talking about and, and not uh, expand it because everything ultimately is linked to everything else. You know? <laughs> You'd never stop. Regarding UNITA now, mm. because <clears throat> the Clark Amendment essentially banned overt uh, and, and, and covert support for these armed groups, either in Central America or in Southern Africa. And um, now, you were for the repeal of the Clark Amendment. Mm -hmm. Presumably, if my if my interpretive skills are as Fordham taught me to have them. Um, it would be such that it would give more leverage to get the Cubans out. Because by having not only, um, let's say, the, the pre-1986 uh, um, Anti-Apartheid Act where sanctions were placed, but also being able to support the rebel group UNITA, it would enable, I suppose, the military advantage to South Africa and its ally, we'll call them, uh, UNITA. Can you go a little bit into that, into uh, the, 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 strategic, the strategic aspect of those mm. two, the Clark and the anti-apartheid, your thoughts on those? You know, negotiators like to have uh, tools to work with. They like to have carrots and sticks. They like to have the ability to apply and withdraw carrots and sticks. Um, they also like to be able to work with other tools like um, intelligence sharing or persuasion or guarantees. There's lots of things that negotiators worked with. The Clark Amendment was unilateral disarmament imposed on the executive branch by the Congress um, in the circumstances of the 1970s, right after the Vietnam debacle and, and all the rest. And, and um, what it did was to say that the United States would have to operate in Southern Africa with one hand tied behind its back. We couldn't support movements that we felt might be in our interest to support. And I supported repeal, not because I, I necessarily believe that we should go back into the covert assistance business, that's a separate question, but because it would send a signal. It would send a signal to the MPLA, America is back. It would send a signal to the Cubans that America is back and to the Soviets. And since the Soviets were providing between one and two billion dollars a year in 
what effect, in effect, was uh, military loans to the MPLA regime. Um, this was a very asymmetrical situation. So, yes, I supported repeal of Clark. It didn't come until 1985. When it did come, we had a big internal discussion inside the administration as to what to do with the new authority that we had. Should we, in fact, um, go back into supporting UNITA with um, covert assistance? Um, or should we just leave the tool on the table and refer to it so people would know we had the option, you know? <laughs> In the end, we decided to go forward with a, I would underscore this, a very modest but important program of military um, assistance and some associated training. And I say modest, I mean a, a tiny, tiny fraction of what the Soviets were still doing. Nonetheless, it sent a message. It sent a message because it included things like um, ultimately surface-to-air missiles, sent a message to Cuban pilots. You know, so, so that was one signal. When it comes to the South African side of the equation, we sent them a lot of signals over the course of the 70s and the 80s. There were sanctions in place when President Reagan entered office. When things began to get really ugly in the South African urban areas in 83, 84, 85, and so on, we sent some more sanctions, but they were executive branch sanctions. Then Congress, because of the anti-apartheid movement and other things, Congress adopted uh, legislation which came to be the Comprehensive Anti-Apartheid Act, which was passed um, in 1986 over the veto of President Reagan. Since you raise it, why did, why did he veto it? He vetoed it because it was really a struggle over who conducts American foreign policy, the Congress or the executive. He also didn't like the rigidity and, and the uh, inflexibility of some, some of the measures in it. And he believed that trade sanctions would probably hurt black South Africans more than they would hurt the white controlled economy. Mm -hmm. um, this was a big debate at the time as you're as you're aware. Um, economic trade sanctions are a very blunt instrument and they do not tend to hurt the government as much as they hurt the civilian economy, black, white, pink or green. Uh, you know, the people who were hurt by sanctions tend to be civilians, not the, not the officials. <laughs> officials can protect themselves usually. So there were arguments about the efficacy of sanctions but we believed in pressures on the South African regime and, and, and we were applying our own. We were also pointing out to them nonstop that unless they worked with us on our Namibian framework, they were on their own. What did that mean? That they were on their own facing a region in which the Soviets and their allies were well established. So that was, I mean, I'd say that to the South African Defense Minister. You don't want to work with me? Go ahead. You can have Southern Africa by yourself and see how nice it is without any Western negotiated framework. Thank you for this time. Now, when we were talking with all of these old Swapo guys, they were adamant that it was much less the diplomatic aspect that led to the Brazzaville Accords, that it was their success in, they, they, they would cheer to be the Battle of Quito Cornavale day after day, every, everyone that we talked to. Now, <laughs> how, uh, how much did the military aspect matter? Because we know that South Africa, uh, that, I'm sorry, SWAPO facing South Africa did not have a particularly effective armed force, at least based on the research that we've done, that it was sort of a token movement, uh, a propaganda tool at, at, at best, maybe to the OAU or the internal wing. How much did the military aspect matter in bringing these parties to the table in, in 88? I think all, there's, there's a lot of different factors that brought the parties to the table. Um, 
as you have correctly said, SWAPO was a minor factor militarily. It never really liberated anything in Namibia. But its raids tied down South African troops, the raids across the border. And, and South Africa had to respond and then go back into Angola and try to beat up SWAPO in the SWAPO camps. And the South Africans um, had to mobilize uh, their own uh, draftees, uh, largely white army in South Africa, with, with um, a number of auxiliary forces that, um, like the 32 Battalion and others that you probably heard about, Kufut and others, the, the, the local um, uh, black recruits that were recruited from Angola and from Namibia and from South Africa to work alongside the white forces. The point I'm making is that uh, while SWAPO didn't liberate anything, it was a thorn. But the major factor were the, the, the South African, FAPLA, Cuban uh, struggles that took place just about every other year. There was a big offensive in, 80, in, uh, in 81, there was one in 83, there was one in 85, there was one in 87. I don't know quite why that rhythm. They were always in the dry season because that's when armored equipment can move around is when it's not raining. <laughs> and uh, these offensives and counteroffensives seldom produced very much, but they kept getting bigger and more expensive. You know? The South Africans had a pretty good year in 87, and they really cleaned the clocks of the, F of the FAPLA, the, the MPLA Army. Um, it was in that context that Fidel Castro went to the 60th anniversary of the Soviet Revolution in Moscow. And I write about this in my, in my memoir, High Noon in Southern Africa. Castro went to, went to Moscow and he said to the Russians, you know what, <laughs> your offensives and counteroffensives are not working very well. <laughs> If you'd like me to take over the war, I know how to fight. I know how to fight these guys. And I will increase the, the size of the Cuban deployment. And we will, we will bring this to a head. And I wasn't in the room when, when these conversations took place, but I know from conversations and interviews that that's more or less what he said. The Russians were sort of looked at, what do, what do you mean you're going to take over the war? We will increase our deployment. And it was shortly after that that we began to see from our overhead, from our intelligence, that the Cuban uh, deployment uh, had changed. And we could read what they were doing from satellite pretty well, uh, from maybe 25 to 30,000 troops to very close to 50,000 troops. Um, 50,000 Cuban troops in Angola is about comparable to the U.S. force that was deployed in Vietnam at the height of the Vietnam War. It's a big, big commitment. There's no way Castro could sustain it. He could do it, but he wasn't going to do it for 10 years. He, he'd already been there for a long time. We now know that the reason he did it was to use it as a negotiating card rather than, you know, to say, I'm going to conquer the place and kick butt and go down into Namibia and so forth. It was a negotiating card. We now know that. At the time, it wasn't so obvious. So what you're seeing here is escalation on both sides. The South Africans had, had a good war in 1987. And then here comes Castro raising the ante in the early months of 1988. And then there was that battle you referred to, the Battle of Quito Quanaval, which was in fact a standoff. It wasn't a great um, a Cuban victory, but it was a standoff. And at the end of it, uh, South, South African artillery and Cuban tanks kind of disengaged, and South Africans pulled back, and the Cubans took all that buildup and moved it to the so southwest from Quito Guanaval. So I, th I think that there was a sense of um, the military balance being still balanced, but at a higher level. That's the way I would summarize my answer to you. Um.
there was never any really major battles, the, but there were some, some serious exchanges of tank, tank uh, warfare and, and high-powered artillery. The South Africans deployed their G5s and G6s, which were the best artillery in the world at that time. And the Cubans had air power, and they had air superiority over much of that area. I would just, to make the point clearer, the South Africans had an air force. But if they lost aircraft, they couldn't replace them because they were under military sanctions. The Cubans could get more aircraft from the Soviet Union. So the South Africans were very wary about tangling up too much with the Cubans in dogfights in the air. So this was like, uh, and I've used the analogy in my book, this was like two, uh, two scorpions in a bottle and they were trying to figure out, uh, do we fight? Do we bite each other or do we de-escalate? <laughs> and at the end they decided to, to de-escalate. But you know, the reason that it worked is that we had a framework that had something in it for everybody. A negotiated transition in Namibia, a free election, SWAPO get, comes back home, has a chance to compete, and the Cubans depart Angola in a staged manner. So ultimately it was a win-win. Thank you. I'd like to then touch, I know by this point you no longer were in your official role, but once the United Nations Transition Group, Transition Assistance Group came onto the ground, the Blue Helmets, and started to negotiate this um, election and whatnot, what, what, how did you feel that that transition went with regards to Namibia itself as opposed to the whole region with right, the right, and whatnot? Well, it was, uh, it was one of the great success stories of UN peacekeeping. It was a, a great success. It was a success because it was a balanced deal. It was a success because the South African authorities were themselves in transition over their own political transition at home, but also because they saw that there'd be something in it for them, namely the Cuban departures that I've talked about. And there were other factors. UNTAG, the UN Transition Assistance Group, was very well prepared. It was very well staffed. It had good troops. It had outstanding political leadership in the form of former Finnish President Marty Adesari, who had been working to prepare himself for the role of transitional leader of the country, basically, for years. And I worked closely with, with Marty and have the highest respect for him. In the final year of our negotiations in 1988, he came with me on some of these negotiations, even though he wasn't formally at the table, but he'd come with me and, you know, I'd ask his, his view of things and he'd ask what I was thinking of doing and, and had I thought about this or that. It, it was a, a partnership, you know. So I, I developed a great respect for him and he had a good team around him. It was a professional operation, you know. and. Uh, so my view was that it was being well handled. It got off to a rocky start, as you may know from the chronology. April of 89 was a bit rugged. SWAPO um, tried to break off the leash it was on in Angola and come across the border without um, the agreement of the South Africans or of the UN. The Angolans claimed not to be aware of what SWAPO was doing. The Angolans were lying through their teeth. Um, you know, Southern Africa's got a lot of pretty interesting characters and, and some of them <laughs> will tell you the truth and some of them won't. Uh, um, the Soviets were alarmed because you know, they, they thought this thing could lead to, you know, a major confrontation and they didn't really want to see that. But you know who was really most angry when that happened in April of 89 was, this, was the Cubans. because. Castro had worked very hard to set things up for this negotiated transition. And I remember when I, I went down to Namibia for the meetings at Mount Echo in April of 89 and talked to my Cuban counterpart and he, he actually said something along the lines of, El Jefe is not happy <laughs> about all this. 
<laughs> anyway, we worked it out in the end, but it was a, a drama, you know. But the rest of the, rest of the transition went, went quite well. Um, South Africans were confined to base and respected their terms of confinement for the most part. Um, the elections uh, were quite smooth. The Constituent Assembly uh, put into place the, uh, the constitutional principles that we had negotiated back in 1982, and they were proud of them because th they made them theirs. They were no longer ours. They were theirs, and that's, that's fine. You know. And now, I guess this is a question about conflict resolution in general, because I've read <coughs> one of the more effective ways to ensure a democratic transition from like prolonged violence and things like this is to keep the economic structures intact, mm -hmm. which is more or less what was done in South Africa and Namibia. And the people we talked to in Namibia were not too fond of this, because if you look, the, the, the division of wealth is very, very high in Namibia and uh, in more or less the whites are better off than they were under apartheid. And how at the time did the international community, what, what did they think of, of, of this, leaving all the economic structures intact? Because I know in Southern Africa, in Angola and Mozambique, where that was not the case, it, it deteriorated into civil war. But can you talk mm. a little bit about that briefly? I guess it's more just a, a, a conflict transition sort of thing. Yeah. Well, the best case of what not to do is Mozambique, uh, because that situation, the Portuguese just fled. And the Portuguese, a lot of the Portuguese um, who lived in Mozambique uh, before 1975, they were running everything. They, they weren't just at the very top of the bureaucracy. They were running most of the bureaucracy, and they were running, you know, mom and pop grocery stores, and they were running everything in between. Um, Portugal is not itself a wealthy country, and a lot of the Portuguese were what we might call middle class today in the United States. They were, they were not rich, you know. Anyway, they got scared of the transition. They saw uh, the Frelimo government coming in, and they fled. Where did they flee to? They fled to South Africa, mostly. Some of them went home to Portugal, but most of them went to South Africa. Uh, and they cr that, that created a massive vacuum, and, and the Mozambican economy just completely collapsed, and, and, and uh, Frelimo took them years to get anything going again in terms of economic development. So, uh, yeah, we, we didn't see any, any merit in that, and, and nor did our Western allies, nor did most of the people we spoke to in South Africa, for that matter, um, a black or white. Um, if, if you, if you um, destroy the financial and industrial infrastructure, the technical infrastructure of a country, what do you replace it with? You replace it with guns. You replace it with people thinking that they can uh, pass laws to decide what <laughs> the wage rates will be. Well, you don't decide wage rates by passing laws. You decide wage rates by, by collective bargaining. And as an example, Cyril Ramaphosa, a name that we will come to hear a lot more of, who is the now the deputy president of the ANC. He was the lead uh, negotiator in the, uh, in the Black Mining Union in South Africa in the 1970s. Uh, he understands about collective bargaining, and, and so it was a good thing to see him come, come back. Um, you know, I don't accept the idea that what you had was a very, very asymmetrical um, ownership structure of the economy during South African uh, white rule in Namibia. Today there are uh, a significant number of black Namibians who have become part of a middle class and part of the uh, elite class, if you like. This is a transition. It's not going to be done over, it's not going to happen overnight. And White Namibians have a role to play. They have skills that uh, perhaps are in short supply. And as long as that's the case, and as long as they're welcomed, they'll stay. If they're not welcomed, they'll leave. I think they, one has to ask, um, is that really what 
the black majority governments of Namibia and Angola want? Do they want them to leave? If they want them to leave, they can make them leave. But is that really in the interests of the country? That's the question, you know, ultimately. Ask, ask the Zimbabweans how they feel about it. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have any other questions? Because I'm out of, of my notes. Oh, that's yeah. the, final, the final little <laughs> question. <laughs> there are your questions. Okay. Yeah, we, so we have one question regarding what you guys thought of the leadership of Swapo, because um, we're intrigued by this fellow at San Miguel, okay? Because we went to the, you know, about a week after we got there, we went to their, their proclaimed heroes April. And there's the unknown soldier who bears a very striking resemblance to him with the beard and this World War I style grenade, which I don't think they used, <laughs> and he, he never fought. I mean, he wore fatigues, but he barely fit into them because he ate a lot. But when it came to negotiations <laughs> with Swapo, what were the best means to to seek this sort of cooperation. Mm -hmm. Because it, it seems to us going through this that a lot of the higher up leadership, other than presenting themselves as a face or taking photos with Julius Nereri, and what role did they serve when it came to diplomacy with Swapo? Who was best to deal with them or say the the lower level bureaucrats within the party? Yeah, the first point I'd make is that we were negotiating with states, the Angolan government, the South African government, the frontline state governments, the contact group governments. Um, we talked to the political parties inside Namibia and the ones like Swapo that were in exile. That but we actually looked to the frontline states to negotiate with Swapo. And the frontline states were the ones that brought Swapo to the altar on, on most of the agreements that we reached that were negotiated actually with Swapo. Yes, we talked to Swapo, and Swapo talked to us, and we made a habit of, of uh, seeing their people in various, in New York and in Washington when they visited, and in Germany. We saw them often in Germany. We, we saw internal Swapo when he went to Windhoek. Um, sometimes we'd see Swapo in Luanda and Angola. Um, but I would say that we were not negotiating directly with Swapo because the terms, a lot of the things Swapo wanted had already been agreed in Resolution 435. So we weren't undoing that. We weren't chucking it out and starting over again. We were adding some things to it. Swapo wasn't interested in the Cuban issue. In fact, Swapo hated the Cuban issue. It claimed that we were using the Cuban issue to delay their independence, which was not the case, but that's that was the spin they put on it, right? So I had quite a few meetings with uh, Sam Nyoma. Um, I had more meetings with Teo ben Gurirab, who was their um, UN rep, a highly capable and impressive person. I mean, a, a, a diplomat's diplomat, you might say. He was somebody you, you would uh, figure you could sit down with and you could figure out if it's worth having the conversation or not pretty soon. And, and he would inform you of his views and you'd inform him of yours and then you'd see, well, now what? And you, you'd get somewhere. Um, we occasionally saw uh, Toivo. Toivo was not a diplomat. He was a political heavyweight, like, like Nayoma. Um, you know? Neither one of them are people that you'd expect would be very good negotiators. They had a certain charisma as movement leaders, let me put it that way, you know. Poster, poster children, maybe, is the word for it. There were others, the um, Hidipo Hamutenya, uh, who, I um, don't know if you met with him while you were down there, or saw him, or? He's 
taboo name. He left the party. <laughs> All the more reason to talk to him. Well, we, we talked to his, his third in command. We got to talk to, because um, he formed this other political party, RDP, mm -hmm. in Namibia. And no, he's a, he's a taboo name. He's written out of history now. Well, he's, maybe he's too competent for some of the people who are still in the party. Um, maybe he's a, his competence might be a threat. He's, he's a very candid, clear thinking person. Not necessarily friendly to us, but, but it very direct and very helpful to talk to. Um, and uh, Hagi Geingab, uh, we talked with him occasionally too. So he went to our college. We, we met with him and everything. Yeah. Each of these uh, Swapo people were, each of them was distinct. Each was different. Each one had his, his own MO, you might say, you know. And, and that's probably the way they looked at us, you know. The, um, I respected some of them more than others in terms of whether they were interested in a solution. Some of them were just interested in scoring points. Yeah. yeah? It was sort of like this set piece arguments. Why don't you drop your linkage so that we can get on with the process of resolution 435? To which I was sometimes tempted to say, you know what? Ronald Reagan has other things to do besides Southern Africa. Would you like us to disengage? <laughs> Anyway, the story is we did not disengage. We got the job done. So. <laughs> We're glad you did. Dr. Crocker, thank you very much for talking to yeah, us. Yeah, you're most welcome.